Ronnie and Reggie Cray, the twins who became the undisputed bosses of East End Gangland. Were they born villains, or did fate shape them for the role? A lot of people s stole things because they were hungry. They had no other means to, uh, to live. I know people say, oh, we other people got out the East End and um, they made it. But it's not like that for everybody. I mean, some people are more brainy than others. Um, they have more chances. And in your life, you mean to go one way and you're pulled another. It's not the individual fault all the time. The Crays had got something about them that was almost indefinable. To say that they were personalities is wrong because they projected an aura of evil, of power. They would resort to violence at the slightest provocation to establish a reputation. And this they did very, very successfully. So that not only foreigners and people that intruded in the, into the East End, but members of their own gang respected them because of that violence. But if the Greys were so evil, why did the community in which they lived put up with them for so long? In London's poorer quarters, the line between right and wrong had long been blurred. Many of life's simple pleasures were outlawed by the state. Late night drinking, card and dice games, and off course betting. I mean, I lived in a place called South Grove Buildings. It was a big old block of flats. There was at least three bookmakers in there used to take the bets. And uh, they all got a living. And all of a sudden they might say, uh, to my dad, Barney, my dad's you know, Barney, got nick you today. So it'd be his turn to get nicked, he'd take him to court. Uh, illegal bookmaking, street bookmaking, might get found f a fiver. The East End contained many illegal drinking and gambling clubs, which were frequently targeted by the police. People were in there playing cards, and then the police was raided. They'd take them to the police station, have to appear in court next morning, get fined. 10 shillings, 5, whatever it was in them days. And that's where the people thought, what, what are we doing wrong? All we're doing is playing cards. We're not doing anything wrong. And they're arresting us. And so they lost their respect for them. Down the East End, the police were sort of natural enemies in some extent. And people didn't come running in with information unless it was to their benefit. Because there was so little respect for the law itself, Many East Enders were unwilling to call on the police to investigate even serious crimes. They're a community of their own. They've lived hard, they've had a hard time, but it was their ethics and a code of honour that um, you didn't normally grasp. But this code of honour exposed the community to exploitation by professional criminals who turned it to their own advantage. In the East End, the law that was enforced was often the law of the Cray twins, Ronnie and Reggie. The twins ran that part of London like an iron rod. There was nothing that went on in that East End that they didn't know about. If there was a wrongdoing, get off the manor, because they would come down on you like a ton of bricks. Well. You know they keep saying about protection, they was running the protection racket. It wasn't actually <coughs> like it sounds. You would go, they would go into a place and say, if you don't give me a, we look after you, if you don't pay this, you'll be in trouble and all that. The people actually used to go to them and want them to look after it and let, let it be known that they was looking after a place. They wasn't <coughs> actually, I suppose it is a protection racket in a way, but it, it was worked on a different basis. People used to go to them and ask them to look after them. There were lots of people that walking into pubs, pubs that were taking a lot of money in those days. Remember we were talking about the early 60s when live music and good entertainment was uh, throughout the East End, throughout every part of London. And protection money was being asked for. And therefore, rather than pay three, four, five, ten bullies, um, it's better to go and ask Ronnie and Reggie Cray, could you just appear for ten minutes or have one or two drinks in our pub on a Saturday night? Once it was known as a pub that the Crays used, then that publican didn't have any more trouble. They only went into people that were breaking the law. You know, like if you had a publican who was having a laugh to timer, then they could go into him. Or if they had a club where they were doing illegal gambling, dice, spieling or something like that, they would go into them. They want their whack. But no way could they ever go into straight people. Because the first, if they come into you, the first thing you do is pick the phone up. Give me the police. And that was it. 
So the only people they could intimidate were people that couldn't phone the police. I was known as Reggie's man. Scotch, Scotch Ian Barry was known as Ronnie's man. The, the twins themselves would, would never like go on a, an organised robbery or a blagging or anything like that. They considered that the work of jailbirds, in their own words. But as soon as they heard of somebody who had it off, they, their first concern was, did they know anyone on the team? If they do, then they would go in for their whack, as it was known, their share. If he says, I'm not going to give you any money, you don't jump all over him. You come back and you say he's not going to pay. Ah, now, that would be a different mission. Go and get three or four guys and go and sit on his house or a pub or a club where he drinks. And give him a talking to, you know. Send him to the hospital for a couple of days and then talk to him again. That's, that was everyday firm work. To take the heat off their activities as criminal overlords, the Crays maintained an elaborate facade of public relations. They, they were very conscious of the public image. They were. They, they worked a lot on it. And so what they would do is hire or, or use one of their own clubs and let it be known that they were organising a, a charity night. They didn't put their hands in their pockets and say, oh, look at this, I'm shocked about the... Uh, the children's unit has got no scanner or whatever. Uh, I'm going to put this money in. No, they would get other people to give it to them. Then they would hand it over, uh, the, the cameras and whatever, and take the glory from it. News of these up-and-coming charitable sportsmen was by now hitting Fleet Street. But to some crime reporters, the story didn't quite add up. Norman Lucas of the Sunday Mirror sought to win the Cray's confidence in search of the truth. He found the twins at their club, the Double R. There was a constant flow of villains in and out, and uh, they would stand at the other end of the bar and there would be whispered conversations, and then Reggie would say, well, I will be a minute, and he'd detach himself and go along the other end of the bar and have whispered conversations with these various people. It was then that I began f to get my first suspicions that uh, the craze weren't what uh, they were pretending to be, very, very honest chaps who were working for charities. Norman Lucas nursed his suspicions about the craze, but many patrons of the Double R saw nothing in the twins' conduct to disturb them. Uh, Ronnie and Reggie were always the customer side of the bar with the customers. They were just socialising the whole time. You were never aware of any business going on whatsoever. They were just in the company all the time. As we always said, if you want to be treated like a lady, you'd be speaking to a villain. I've, I, I mean, I've been invited to lots of Chelsea parties with Hooray Henrys. I've heard language that I would never, ever hear um, in the East End when I was out with Ronnie and Reggie Cray. God, there'd be one look from his eyes if anyone dared to swear in front of his mother or his aunt or myself or any other lady in his presence. Say they used to come to the Astor. You could feel, you could feel a certain atmosphere the Cray twins had arrived. That was the atmosphere that, that people got. I don't think it was fear. It was just, I suppose it, well, I suppose if the Queen was to walk in, every time I said, look, is the Queen there? there, there, there would, something, a feeling would arise. This royal progress might have continued unchecked, but for Ronnie's recurring bouts of mental instability. In 1958, he was committed to a mental hospital after attacking a man with a bayonet. Reggie Cray invited Norman Lucas to accompany him on a visit. Reggie went in to this uh, mental hospital and uh, I thought Reggie came out and we drove off in a bit of a hurry. I must say, I mean, I was being driven. I wasn't, I was in their car. And um, so I turned round to Reggie like an idiot and said, uh, 
uh, well, um, how was Ronnie? And uh, he said, well, I'm bloody Ronnie. He said, Reggie's in there now. And I thought, Jesus, what have I got myself into? I, I said, uh, but, but, but you, you, you mean you're, you're, you're now an escaper? And he said, ah, oh, well, I'm not really, am I? He said, they shouldn't have put me in there in the first place. I'm perfectly sane. Why should they do that? And um, I, 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 I thought, well, what, now where the hell does this put me? I mean, I'm, I'm just a newspaper man. The switch pulled off. Reggie walked free. But Ronnie was now a fugitive and Lucas perhaps an accomplice. With Reggie at his elbow, Lucas called on contacts at the Home Office to negotiate a surrender deal for Ronnie with no penalties attached. And I came off the phone and Reggie said, I wouldn't have bloody believed it if I hadn't been standing in the phone box. He said, what's he saying, this man in the Home Office? I said, well, you heard. I said, if Ronnie will give himself up now or tomorrow morning, he will go back there, but he won't necessarily stay there. And uh, Reggie said, well, that's bloody marvellous. He said, how is it you know such high-powered people at the Home Office? Said, all part of the job, Reggie, all part of the job. The job Lucas was really doing was penetrating the Cray's empire in order to expose them. It wasn't easy, but following Ronnie's release, the police were having even less success. It was always difficult to try to mount an action against the craze uh, if you worked in the East End. I mean, the story always was that whenever there was a serious crime in the East End, it was down to the craze. On two occasions, I was approached by individuals, one of whom had a small club, the other had a small business making perfume for these suitcase sellers in Oxford Street, both of whom were threatened by the crazed to pay their rent, as they called it. And um, if they didn't, they got beaten up. And in fact, the chappy with the poor perfume, he, he got his place burnt down. And the answer is yes, they got there by fear and the lack of evidence. In July 1964, Scotland Yard set up a special squad to investigate the crazed rackets. But even after Nipper Reed had taken the twins into custody, key witnesses mysteriously withdrew their evidence, including one woman who had begged him to free her from the craze. When we said that we were taking these people away, they were going to be arrested, she fell down on her knees and grasped my legs in her arms and said, thank God, thank God, you've saved my life. And I said, we'll come later and take a statement from you thinking that the next day would suffice. But the next day, of course, as, as happened in those days, we'd arrested the craze at one o'clock in the morning. We, they were charged and they appeared at court the next day. The, on that day, when they appeared at Old Street Magistrates Court, this lady, now resplendent in furs and high-heeled shoes, was there all very nicely dressed and saying, uh, Mr. Reed, I'd like to stand bail for my good friends, the Cray Twins. And so Reed's first bid to jail the craze collapsed. With Ronnie and Reggie back on the streets, they seemed invincible. But crime reporter Norman Lucas had hit on a sensational story. Lord Boothby, a leading member of the House of Lords, had been caught up in a homosexual relationship with Ronnie Cray. Ronnie uh, didn't hide the fact that he was a homosexual. No. He liked young boys, young men. There were writers, there were the politicians, like the famous ones like Boothby, Dryberg and a few others. Supposing R Ronnie might fancy a showbiz, so he used to put what they call a W out. It's a warrant. Anybody can get him back to the twins would get a payment of some sort of cash. We were all up, up the West End somewhere one night in, in this uh, well-known Chinese place. And we saw this guy sitting on his own. And Ronnie spied him and said, who's that? And somebody said, that's Cliff Richards, uh, an up-and-coming star, you know. And, uh, ooh, I'd like to meet him, you know. So straight away, there's a W out for him. If anyone can get him in to a meet, that's all he's got to do. 
old Cliff, I don't particularly like his singing and all that, but he don't seem a bad guy. I wouldn't have hate to see him involved with that sort of person, you know. I thought, well, this has gone far enough, and now I think I should write an expose news story. I knew that once I'd done that, I was finished as far as the craze were concerned, but it, it was a story which, in my view, needed to be published, uh, and, uh, and everybody needed to be made aware of of what they really were, so that no more titled people or um, prominent show business people should be uh, caught up in their web. The problem was the sexual revelation at the heart of the story. The newspaper was delighted with the scoop and wanted to run it. Lucas himself was not so sure. I said, well, we can't. We we can run the story about their association with a peer, but we must not use the word homosexual because who are we going to call if Booth be sued? Who can we call to prove this? We'll be sued for libel. But Lucas was overruled. The newspaper's lawyer, Philip Levy, worked out a formula to protect the mirror from a libel action. And uh, Levy said, well, as long as you just say uh, the yard are probing a homosexual relationship between Ronald Cray and a peer, uh, you will be safe. And, uh, but don't mention Lord Boothby's name. The allegation was inserted into Lucas's story. The Mirror went ahead and published. But then, of course, the, the, the walls came tumbling down on the Monday because Boothby did the most cunning thing in the world. He wrote a letter to the Times saying, uh, everybody says this is me. And on that basis, he sued us and uh, got £46,000 damages, which, as I learned just 48 hours later after he got the money, he was forced to hand over to the craze who blackmailed him and said, well, if you don't, we will say this is a true story. Now the Cray twins seemed untouchable, but the old demons of paranoia returned to haunt Ronnie. The slightest squeak of opposition was enough to trigger the most extreme of responses. With Ronnie, it, it was different. It was a bit more weird, if you like, because uh, other people's violence if he heard about it, he would get him to sit down and give it to him detail by detail. He he got something out of it, you know. He was definitely Freddy Krueger type person, you know. I mean, Ronnie would smash somebody, he would literally smash him, you know, with whatever he had in his hand. Doesn't matter if it was a hammer, a, a bayonet or an axe or whatever. He would just slice somebody for the wrong word. One man with no respect was George Cornell, who had publicly ridiculed Ronnie for his sexual preferences. People said to him, George, you know, you want to be careful. You're, you're going over the top. You keep, Ronnie won't stand for this if you go. You know what he is? He's a nutter. That's how people say. He won't stand for this. And he carried on and carried on. Ronnie uh, even said to me, I don't know what he thinks he is, that Cornell. He better not go too far with me. In 1966, Cornell drove into the heart of Cray territory to take a very public drink in the Blind Beggar pub with his South London friend, Albie Woods. We walked in the pub, we walked to the end of the bar. George plunks himself right in the corner with his back to a, a petition. And by the side of George, there were some curtains which led into the public bar. And this was at ten past eight in the evening. There were a number of other people in the pub, 32 people altogether in fact, and, and the barmaid was behind the bar and so on. It was the, the normal kind of evening in a pub of that kind, when suddenly the door burst open and Ronnie Cray walked in with another man. I think someone has stopped a couple of feet before they've reached me and about a step backwards, like, you know, near enough behind me. I looked back at George. Oh, I looked, I didn't... I noticed there was a gun pointing at George. I looked back at George quick. George was really snarling at him, sneering at him. Ronnie drew from his pocket a Luger 
uh, uh, automatic gun and, and just pointed it at Cornell's head and shot him straight through the forehead. Well, it was absolutely terrible. You, you can imagine being there and there's people firing guns like in your direction. And all I've got is a stool, you know, in front of me. And, you know, it's, what for, I don't know. The stool wasn't going to do any good. You, you don't think of nothing. You know, all I was thinking of was any second light is going to be me. Within minutes, the bar was empty. People were gone. The, the people that were with Cornell had left. George was moaning and sort of groaning, like, you know. Anyway, I stood up. There was nothing I could do. I knew the ambulance was on its way, and I didn't want to get involved, and I walked out the pub. There was really no motive. It, it was just a question of Ronnie trying to assert himself as a gang leader, to show that he was like the Americans, that he'd got his button, as they say, that he'd killed his man. He wanted to show his gang that he was really the colonel. He wanted the public to know that he was a gang leader. And so it was with this in mind that he was able to walk into the blind beggars with 32 other people inside, with no attempt to disguise himself, confident because of his ab ability as a gang leader that he could walk in there and know that no one would give evidence against him. Charlie Cray was unaware of the shooting. A few hours later, he was summoned to meet Ronnie. He said, what's the matter? He said, oh, I've, I've just shot Cornell. So I said, oh, what are you doing What, in a pub? You've gone in a pub and shot someone in a pub? Oh, I said, oh, do me a favour, Ron. You know what happened now. You'll, they'll have you by tomorrow. Don't worry about that. Ronnie eluded the police. But it wasn't long before they caught up with Albie Woods. They said, right, now we want you to name who killed George Cornell. I said, I don't know who killed George Cornell. I said, I never saw their face. I said, it happened so quickly. I said, and, you know, just that they were standing behind me. I said, the, the shot, you know, went right across my face into George. Oh, and when we tried to get witnesses, people said they didn't see anything, they didn't hear anything, you know, it's as, as if the thing had never happened. Uh, the barmaid said she was downstairs, she was in the cellars uh, trying to get some more drinks up and things of that kind. And so that there was this desperate situation where suddenly this, this dramatic event had taken place and nobody had seen anything. But they kept trying and kept putting plenty of pressure on and, you know, but uh, with all the pressure and all what I was offered, you know, or no way could they win with me. I'd sooner be in, inside for the rest of my life and, you know, grasp people up. When I think about the Cornell case and all the problems, that was the really the beginning of the worst problems I was ever going to have. When I knew what happened, when they told me, I thought, I was just sick inside, you know, and uh, I thought then that this is the beginning of the end. Further evidence of Ronnie's deteriorating condition was the extraordinary scheme to spring his old friend, Mad Axe Man Frank Mitchell, from Dartmoor Jail in the absurd hope that it would force the Home Office to grant him an early release. In fact, it was hardly an escape at all. Mitchell simply walked away from a Moorland work party and was picked up in a car by Donoghue. We were actually in Fulham when he came on the news that he'd been reported missing. Anyway, he ran up in a flat in, over in Barking and he started performing. You imagine, if all the psychiatrists and screws and whatever can't control this guy, what chance have the twins got, you know? Yeah, we got him a girl, hostess out one of the clubs, keeping quiet. That worked for a couple of weeks. But it soon became clear that Frank Mitchell was more trouble alive than dead. They wanted him to give himself up and go back to prison, but of course, uh, it was too late then. Mitchell had enjoyed this uh, comfort, relative comfort. He'd enjoyed the, the pleasures of this uh, young girl. And so he said, no, I'm not going back. And then he became an encumbrance. And so then it was decided that they got to do something very positive about him. They told Mitchell that he was going to another house in, uh, in Kent. It has never been proved who was behind the events that unfolded next. Pack up, get him out of the flat. Take him round the corner. The guy stood on the pavement, opened the back of this old Thames-type van. I get in, there's two guys sitting on a wheel casing on the left. 
the wheel casing on the right is empty, so Frank got in first. I went to sit beside him. They said, now you go up the front and tell the driver how to get back to the tunnel. And I'm, talk I'm saying to the driver like a plum, I'm saying just go down, do a right and a right, and you're back on Barking Road. In the meantime, the guy shut the back doors. He's come round to where he's going to sit in the passenger door. Gets in. The van is running now. He gets in. As he slams the passenger door, I later found out that was the signal. I'm still leaning like an idiot talking to the driver. Bow, bow, bow. The guns start off behind me. And they just kept popping the man. And he came off the casing onto his knees and then he fell back. And these bullets were going all over him. Then he sort of went still. And one of the guys leaned over and put three shots in around the heart. You could see his shirt jumping. And now we're moving. We've done the first right. We're going up. We've got to do the next right. All of a sudden, there's a groan. So the guy said, he ain't, he ain't dead. Give him another one. I'm empty. Now, I'm started thinking, I've got to go as well here. I'm piggy in the middle. Yeah. I was pleased to hear one guy is empty. Anyway, the other guy goes, puts the gun behind his ear and pop. That's the last shot that was fired. Now I'm thinking, the next thing I can do is dive in this cab amongst these two and just start kicking and punching till I can get out. I'm firmly convinced I'm going to die. Anyway, we now come back up to the old Barking Road. So I said, right, all you got to do, drop me off here. Hopefully. So the back door was open, I got out. And I started walking away. And I was still waiting for one in the back of the nut as I was walking away. But when I heard the van pull off, that was it, I was pleased. Ronnie's lust for violence was beyond control. This increased the pressure on Reggie. His marriage to childhood sweetheart Frances Shea was cracking under the strain of her husband's criminal lifestyle. Well, she would smile, but, I mean, what's a smile, you know? You can sit in a dentist's chair and open your mouth and it looks like you're smiling, but there was a lot of glamour to it, I suppose, and it must have looked nice at the time, but when she actually saw how the whole thing was made up, with Ronnie screaming in the background and going into his, his troughs, she must have got sick of probably frightened of it as well. You know? See, because in the early days, they were both homosexual. And then Reggie sort of came away from it. He has asked me how you actually touch a woman to make her excited, liven her up. He didn't know where you touched her, how you touched her or what. And to uh, be honest with you, I don't think he knew where to put it while he was married. The problem was... An ordinary person would have had a, gone through a divorce and met someone else. Now, she couldn't do that. If you can imagine some handsome young chap falling for Franny Cray, and Reggie heard about it, you know, he's going to have his legs cut off. You know, so she could never have a, another life sort of thing. Just two years after her celebrity-style wedding, Franny Cray killed herself with an overdose of sleeping tablets. I've never known anyone in my life to idolise someone like he did her. He really did idolise her. And when she died, it slaughtered Reggie. He was taking tranquilizers, he was drinking, and he was never in, in a right frame of mind for a long, long time. It just crucified him. Distraught with grief, Reggie Cray was unable to help Ronnie in his desperate struggle with madness. If you went to the house, you would see him sitting in his armchair and he'd be like this. He'd be chain smoking and he'd be popping these heavy pills and scowling. He used to scowl a lot. And if somebody said something, it'd be like a general conversation going on. And if he wanted to listen to one particular person, he'd say, shut up, you. 
And now you knew it was time to shut up. Yeah. Because, see, with Ronnie, you could say to him one day, time to go down the caravan or something, you look like you're putting on a bit of weight. That would be okay. You could say exactly the same thing tomorrow. And you would have to fight for your life. Still no one dared to give evidence against Ronnie, but any chance he might have had of getting away with the murder of George Cornell was smashed the night his brother, Reggie, killed Jack McVitie with a carving knife. Jack was a man who had to have a drink and a good time. He was a, a typical what you call a villain. He was over the counter, and what I mean by that, he, 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 he'd been convicted of bank robberies, he had a record of violence. I'm just giving you a background of what Jack McVitie was like. And it came a point where I think people started to get a bit fed up with him, bad mouth of people. All of a sudden, Reggie walked in. Now, right away I knew something was wrong, the way Reggie was reacting. We'd all been drinking that night, because he was biting his lip, Reggie. He wasn't sure, I always got the opinion, he wasn't sure what was going on. And he said, who's downstairs? So I said, well, it's me, Chris, and I checked out down there, wouldn't you? And he bit his lip. I come upstairs to get a pack of the cigarettes out of the machine and Tony Barry's walking towards me, the club owner. And he says to me, uh, there's a party around at Blancale's. So we go down to Blancale's house, which is Nevering Road, and we're having a bit of a joke on the way down. And we go in and we go down the stairs and Jack goes running in the room, where's the party, where's the party? When I walk into the room, I see Ronnie over in the corner watching television. And the next thing, Ronnie pushed past me, went over Tony, and he hit Jack under the eye of a glass, a gin glass, a little glass it was, and he cut him under the left eye. But the next thing that happened, Reggie got a knife in his hand. And Hart pinned him, for some reason, got hold of him. And he let him go, and Reggie tried to shoot him. But the gun failed to go off as a 32 Morza. It was a brand new one. Come on, I mean, I don't believe this is happening. These are professional people. I mean, these are the most professional villains in London. You don't do these kind of things. I thought, what have I got myself involved in here? And I said to, I think it was Connie White, I said, Connie, I don't want no part of this. This is so out of order. And Ronnie Cray came out and he said, what's the matter with Chris? And Connie said he didn't, he, he didn't come down here for this. In the meantime, Jack jumped up, and this is what exactly happened. He walked over to the window and he punched the window, and the words he said were this, who would they think they are? And he punched the window in timber. And for the first time, I was scared. That's what I really felt. I've never told anybody that. And in some, some ways, I felt a coward. There was a part of me wanting to run in and just help the guy out and a part of me held back because I had Tony was there and I mean, I didn't know what he knew or what he didn't know. So I'm really on the horns of a dilemma, you know? Whichever way I turn, I mean, I've got a sword hanging over my head. When the gun fired the goal, I didn't, I thought that would be it. But then again, I look back on it and I think to myself, he had to go. You couldn't leave him free now, we'd set him up. We'd put him in the middle. There was no way out. Whatever way it did, he's going to have to go. The next thing that happened is a carving knife is thrust into Reggie's hand. Now things are moving fast. And all I saw was the knife. It must have stabbed him twice within seconds. Because I see him sagging. And the next thing that happened, Reggie done him in the neck and the, and the knife arched. And I turned away then. And as I turned around again, I saw the two Mills brothers running out of the room. And there's Jack on the floor. But he had a gash in his neck, which I would say went a third of the way around his neck. But he was dead, the blood was everywhere. And there was, a, there was just this silence there for about 30 seconds. No one seemed to realise what had happened. Everyone was looking at each other. And all that happened then was, was Reggie going saying to me, get rid of that, Tony. And they'd gone. I went in, went downstairs, and there's the, the body laid there. But it's hard to understand, unless you, you, he was in my boots, I just didn't think he was dead. 
I just couldn't imagine him. him I mean, he's laying there in front of me. I thought he was going to come to life. I thought he was asleep. I just didn't think he was dead. Then we heard a knock from upstairs, and uh, it was Tony. I said to my brother and, and Ronnie Bent, I said, well, what did we do here? Now, the idea is to get him out of that flat. Went upstairs and got a, a, a quilt, you know, one of them big fleecy kind of quilts, the old-fashioned kind. Got one of them. Got Jack's body put him on the, on the quilt and wrapped it over. Left him in the middle of the floor and systematically went through the whole house, washing up glasses, carpet pulled that up where there was blood stains and all that kind of thing. Come about maybe three o'clock, maybe between two and three, where we ran the body out to the car, lifted up the boot and actually put the body in the blanket and all that in the car, in the boot of the car. Pulled the lid down. We then have an argument about who's going to drive it away. Because nobody wants to be seen that time in the morning. Bearing in mind that I don't know that the offside lamp is not on. It was a two-tone Zodiac. Blue and cream, if I remember it right. I and the other guy got in my car, and Tony set off in that car, in Jack's car. Now, we pull out and we get onto Mare Street, and we're going down Mare Street, and I've got this 38. Now, no way am I going to let anybody take Tony. And the arrangement was, if I'd have been stopped, there would have been trouble. There was no way I was going to take a stop with that. So there's a police car pulls up, gets between Tony and I, and I thought, if they stop him, I'm going to get out and I'm going to do the business. And I let the other guy with me know that. Some reason or other, they turned off. And Tony went on and he went through the Blackwood Tunnel and I followed him up and I went through it after it. A few hours later, the car with McVitie's body in it was abandoned in South London. So we have a meet, but the twins were out a week later. They'd gone up a country in the meantime. And we had a meet in the car with arms. And all that was ever said of it, it was a nuisance. Because my brother said to him, was he a grass? Was he a rock? And they went, no. It was just nuisance. And that is what happened to Jack McVitie. As Charlie Cray told his twin brothers, We could have had a fabulous life before all these murders. We had it made and we could have gone to better things. And as I said, you two would have been somebody. You was fate in life. And I said, now I think it's gone. You've blown it, everything. You know, a mother, father, me, you. We're going to go. I know we are. And everything's finished. The police were now investigating the Craze involvement in at least three murders. At last, they felt they had the evidence needed to mop up the firm. The 34-year-old ex-boxer twins, Reginald and Ronald, came here early this morning with flying squad officers, and they're still here. They were in bed when the squad called at their home in Shoreditch at about six o'clock this morning. But Donahue escaped the net. And I didn't know anything had happened until I get, I get in the lift, go up to the, I forget what floor they were on. I walk along and I see there's two coppers outside their flat. Even that wouldn't normally worry me too much. But I see their front door standing up against the wall. And I thought, oh, yeah. And one of these coppers said, who are you? I said, my name is Donoghue. I've got a cab firm in Bow. And I have a running account with Mr. Cray. And I come once a week to collect. Anyway, he very politely tells me I won't collect that particular week and piss off. So I did. And I was gone. And I, I went all over the place. Wound up in Bethnal Green. Three weeks later, the squad came in. And that was it, wiped up. Nicked. Somebody said, have you heard about the craze? I said, no, I haven't. He said, they've all been arrested. They made a dawn raid. Well, it wasn't a matter of weeks before I was staying at a hotel called The Hearts in Warsaw. 
that the police made a raid there and brought me down to Tin Tajo House. At their headquarters on the south bank of the Thames, the investigating team headed by Leonard Nipper Reed were searching for the first cracks in the wall of silence that protected the craze. You see, this was a conspiracy between a number of people. And when you get that situation, unless one or other is prepared to, to give evidence for the Crown, then it's impossible to break that silence. I tried it, as I've explained, with three of the participants, and all of them had rejected my overtures. And Nipper said, well, do you want to talk to us now? So I said, no, I don't want to talk to you. Why should I want to talk to you? We are asking you what you know about the murder of Jack the Hat might be. I said, I don't know nothing. Well, as we've got it, you were there, but took no actual part in the murder. Uh, in fact, you quietly protested about it. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. So I'm not, I'm not only defended, I mean, I'm lumped with them anyway. There's no way I can get out of it. If I want to change solicitors, I'm going to offend them. You understand what I mean? So really, there was no way of even fighting the case. Um, and really, I mean, there were in many respects, anything you said to defend yourself put them in, 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 in a very, very bad position. So invariably, we said nothing. As far as the twins were concerned, it didn't happen. We can't be seen to be uh, saying something did happen when they denied all knowledge of it. That's a nail in their coffin. And bearing in mind, we were with them. We were involved here. It's not our row, but we were involved. So we've got to sink with them, whether we liked it or not. People have said to me many times, I wouldn't have done that. But they haven't got to look in the mirror. It's me who's got to look in the mirror at the end of the day. And I have to live with that. And I couldn't stand the thought that anything I said would help to convict men and put them down for that length of time. But the persistence of Nipper and his team was rewarded. One after another, former Cray associates broke the criminal code of silence and turned Queen's evidence. Anyway, I go up for a, a solicitor's visit, it's called. I walk in the room, there's the twins and Charlie Cray and old Manny Freedy sitting down. There's an empty chair for me. So we're all sitting down. So they say to me, what do you reckon? I said, well, this is what I've made, notes I've made. Reggie takes the notes, reads them, and just ripped them up. When he sees this, Freedy, he gets up, he says, I'll go and get another chair. Who for? We're all sitting down. He just wanted to be out of the room so they don't hear. Ronnie says, don't bother with notes, Albert. He said, what we're going to do, Scotch Jack is going to hold his hands up for Cornell. Young Ronnie's going to hold his hands up for Jack the Act. And we want you to hold your hands up for Mitchell. And we'll take all the violence and frauds. What a wonderful chap, you know. So I looked at him and I, I said, no. And, well, the temperature went down in that room about 10 degrees straight away. And they're just staring at me. So that was it. I am now off the firm. Freedy comes back, smells it, and he said, My boy, just because you're not a cray doesn't mean you won't get the same treatment. <laughs> I said, yeah. Then he... Donahue trusted his instinct. He pleaded guilty to a lesser offence of being an accessory to murder and was sent to prison for two years. The most damning witness of all proved to be Ronnie Hart, the Cray's own cousin. Once Hart had decided to tell us who was present, what their involvement was, and the fact that they were present, of course, makes them guilty of, of the murder, uh, indeed as, as, as guilty as Reggie Cray had actually wielded the knife. Once he had given that evidence, we could charge all of them, which, which we did. He said, you want to go down with him? You're going to go down with him. Don't stand no nonsense off him. Charge him. Ronald and Reginald Cray were sentenced to life with a recommendation that they should serve a minimum of 30 years. Chris and Tony Lambriano were also sentenced to life. They didn't come out for 15 years. 
Charlie Cray was sentenced to 10 years for being an accessory to murder. But in the East End, there were mixed feelings about the verdicts. When the twins finally got nicked and they got, they got found guilty and, and what happened to them, I was very, very upset, very upset, because even though people think they was uh, murderers, villains, gangsters, I mean, there's a lot of people done a lot worse than them, got a lot less for it and still getting less for it. And in a lot of people's eyes, they'll still go as two nice boys, even though it's might strange strands to, to you, they will be known, still be known as two nice boys. I mean, the whole of the East End was devastated. I don't think they ever dreamed, nobody in the East End thought that they'd be sentenced to 30 years, minimum sentence. But one of the architects of their downfall has no such sympathy. I, I didn't consider them to be friends as such. Uh, okay, I, I, I enjoy having a drink with anybody and I enjoy listening to anybody's stories of this or that. But I felt that at the end of the day, it, it was, I was going to get a first-class story out of it, possibly a book, a feature series, and do a public service in exposing them. And I had no scruples about using them and conning them as much as I could. <laughs>